Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Charlie Nicklin. I'm the Chief Executive of I Agree, and I'd like to thank you all for joining our June lunchtime lecture. I'd like to welcome Dr. Alex Cook from Seven Trent Water as our guest speaker today. Alex completed a PhD at Cranfield University in Agricultural Solutions for Phosphorus Control, and prior to that worked as a soil scientist. Alex started with Seven Trent in 2018 and works as a principal catchment scientist, leading the catchment management team. Her award-winning team's main objective is reducing the risk to drinking water quality by working with the agricultural sector and landowners. Alex has now expanded her team to include wastewater and future carbon offsetting schemes. In today's lecture, Alex will be talking about how nature-based solutions are being adopted as business as usual within the water and wastewater industry to deliver assets that provide more for the communities they serve and the wider environment. Just before Alex starts, you, you're all currently muted. If you'd like to ask questions, then please use the chat function at the bottom of the screen and we'll get you to unmute uh, so you can ask away. So with no further ado, over to you, Alex. Right, yes, well, hello everyone. Um, so as Charlie said, I'm Alex Cook. Um, I'm the Principal Catchment Scientist at Seven Trent. And for, well, basically I'm gonna go through nature-based solutions and what we are doing with them at Seven Trent. Um, it's been, uh, we've been using them for quite a while now. Um, it's formed part of our catchment program and I'm basically going to be going through how we've used them for drinking water supplies and how we're starting to use them to manage our wastewater assets as well. Sort of an emerging piece of work for us. Um, so in this, in the presentation, I'm gonna be going through what nature-based solutions actually are. Um, the seven trends future vision um, and then like i said i'm going to go through the drinking water and wastewater side and all of the challenges that come from working with nature-based solutions because whilst they are uh, an amazing thing and i am totally for plonking nature-based solutions everywhere it isn't as easy as it sounds there are lots of things to consider and a lot of the time it doesn't work so um i'll be just going through some of the challenges and opportunities um, around that as well so to start off, what are nature-based solutions? Well, um, there's quite a few definitions out there, if I'm honest, but the EU have a, a really good one, um, which we quite like here, which is solutions that are inspired and supported by nature. They're cost-effective, they provide environmental, social, and economic benefits, and they help to build resilience. So effectively, they are solutions which can be applied um, in a catchment or in a field or in a, an urban area can be applied anywhere, um, but they will provide more than one benefit. And that could be an environmental benefit or it could be an environmental benefit and something like a social benefit. So they're stackable, it's what we call stackable benefits. And yeah, like I said, they're brilliant because they can be applied anywhere. So whilst we in Seven Trent are predominantly using them um, within uh, agricultural landscapes, um, there are lots of other companies out there that are not just using them like we are, they're using them all across the place in urban locations up to the high peaks. Um, and so they're, they're a really good usable tool to, to deliver real benefit on the ground. So some examples of nature-based solutions um, I've got on the screen right now. So they could be anything from wetlands, which um, we use quite heavily in the work that we do. Um, buffer strips, they're a nature-based solution. Uh, hedges, grasslands, woodlands, uh, wildflower strips or wildflower meadows even. Peatland restoration, re-wetting uh, re of, of wet areas. Um, we've got riparian margins down in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, and then you've got things like scrublands, beetle banks, natural flood management, grass wells, green, green roofs, green walls. The list really does go on and on and on. There are so many nature-based solutions, just that they haven't typically been labelled as nature-based solutions. They've been, they've been sort of um, considered as a, a, a sort of innate object <laughs> rather than collectively um, as nature-based solutions providing multiple benefits. And at Seven Trent, we've, um, like I said, we've been using them for a while now in our catchment program. Um, and really, we've we've seen the benefit that they provide, not just for ourselves as a water company, but for the communities that they get implemented in. 
Um, so really our vision is for nature-based solutions to be the business as usual within all the work that we do. So that we could be operating catchments and assets which are carbon neutral. They require minimal operator intervention. And like I said, they deliver these added benefits to the communities and to the environment that they sit within. Um, I have said that we, we're using them all the time already in our drinking water side of the business of providing clean water um, for, for consumption. Um, but we've only, we've been, within the last year, we started using them um, for the wastewater side of the business as well. That's a very different challenge on the wastewater side of the business. And we've, there's also been a lot of regulatory updates in the last year, which have meant it's even more challenging for us to utilize nature-based solutions as a water company. So I'll be taking you through all that as well. So just to start off, I'm gonna go through the nature-based solutions that we utilize and our approach to using them for uh, drinking water side of the business. So um, uh, drinking waters for consumption, obviously. And we do this through our Farming for Water um, catchment program. Um, and this uh, is a program um, where we are managing the water quality risks that we see at our water treatment works. Now, across the region, the main risks that we see are from pesticides, agricultural pesticides. And this is mainly because they're, they're difficult to, and hard and expensive to treat at our water treatment works. And consequently, the cost of that treatment is put back to customers' bills. And so what we try to do is to try to minimize and manage the pesticide risks at source in the catchment. And that's by working with our farming community instead. So we've got 44 priority catchments and each of these catchments have a different, different risks associated with them in terms of water quality. There's lots of pesticides, but we've also got catchments where there are nitrate risks or cryptosporidium. Um, we've got a few with color issues that impact on the taste of the water. Um, and then increasingly now we're getting more and more with phosphorus issues as well. Um, and we basically tailor our approach with the nature-based solutions and our catchment work um, to target these specific risks of each of the catchments. Um, and consequently, the, the solutions that we're offering um, within each of those catchments to the farmers. Um, Last year, we expanded our approach to also include biodiversity as well. And that was really because we recognized that farmers were more, uh, I guess they were better engaged by wildlife and habitats rather than water quality. Um, but ultimately by implementing biodiversity interventions um, that benefit wildlife, you still get those water quality benefits too. And that really is the foundation of what nature-based solutions are. It's, it's those stackable benefits again. As we, we always say at Seven Trent, by helping nature, we help water too. And it's a bit cheesy, I know, but it, it is true. Um, that, and that's, that's why we take this approach, really. So we deliver our Farming for Water program via quite a, a diverse team, if I'm honest. Uh, we've got seven catchment scientists, of which I'm one of them. Um, and we look at the science and the monitoring and all the data, and we create the strategies to, and designs to build our schemes and our grant programs and the nature-based solutions that we're offering. Um, and then on the ground, we've actually, we've got a delivery of these nature-based solutions through um, a team of agricultural advisors. And we've got both internal advisors and those who are employed by one of the region's rivers trusts or the wildlife trusts. And you can see the trust that we partner with at the bottom of the screen. And this is so that we can maximize the joint working in our priority areas with other stakeholders. And this allows us to create better natural solutions for the environment and ultimately the communities within those areas. And as you can see, um, uh, we've got quite a good spread of catchments throughout the region, consequently very diverse communities and uh, working with stakeholders local to those areas gives us much better, um, sort of, uh, much better benefits, I guess. So what do we offer? I think some of you might have seen this slide before, but I have updated it. Um, but you can see we offer quite a lot at Seven Trent. And this is really what you can see on the screen right now is really just our bread and butter. Um, we do an awful lot of field trials and innovation projects as well. Um, we've got 
but for example, we've just taken a project looking at the reintroduction of beavers, um, utilizing natural flood management techniques to prevent flooding upstream um, of some, some areas um, in Nottinghamshire, or is it Derbyshire? I can't remember which now. Um, and then we've got soil health trials as well. Um, so what you see on screen here is really just the, what we're, we're offering our farming community on a daily basis. Um, and I'm just going to pick out a few of them, which are particularly relevant to the nature-based solutions conversation. So farm to tap um, is the first line up there. So this is a payment for ecosystem services scheme. So this is, i.e., this is a scheme where we're paying farmers for water quality improvements, not necessarily the action that they are taking to get to those improvements. So historically, the farm to tap scheme has been used to tackle metaldehyde, which is the, the slug pellet. Um, that's that well, has been widely used um, and we're paying farmers to use any metaldehyde, metaldehyde reducing practices they feel is um, right for their farm so it could be um, it could be completely not using metaldehyde at all and using something like ferric phosphate or it could be a cultural control such as uh, changing your cropping practice or it could actually still be using metaldehyde metaldehyde just using a lower concentration metaldehyde pellet we don't we're not prescriptive basically we're paying for the outcomes the water quality improvements um, and so for for farms tap the nature-based solutions are effectively chosen by the farmer themselves but they have the added benefit of providing water quality improvements to us and the wider environment um, and Going forward, well, metaldehyde is obviously just now been withdrawn from use, for, from outdoor use anyway. And so going forward, we'll be adapting the farm tap scheme so that we can um, utilize it for other problem pesticides, mainly the oilseed rape herbicides, which are um, the next biggest issue for us in our treatment processes. Uh, the next one is STEPS, the Seven Trent Environmental Protection Scheme. Um, and this is uh, an effect, uh, competitive grant scheme um, through which farmers can apply for up to £10,000 per farm business per year. Um, and this is to make improvements to their farm or the fields, which will benefit water quality. Now, there are priority items which tackle the priority, wa priority water quality issue within their catchment, as I previously said. Uh, but there's also a suite of other options as well. Um, and the options cover both capital infrastructure solutions as well as land management based solutions and basically we'll score the application based on the benefits to the water quality but the applications will score higher the bigger the benefit to other environmental um, goods as well such as biodiversity and linked to this we've actually got steps for biodiversity which is a suite of options to create new habitats um, which can be uh, uh, access on on their farmlands um, and this looks at the not just the benefits of biodiversity and water quality but also to the other public goods such as recreation and access by the local communities does it fall next to a public footpath for instance in its most basic sense um, and so steps really is our main mechanism at seven trent for most of our farmers to implement nature-based solutions um, and consequently to tackle the water quality issues of the catchments that we operate in. Um, and then the last one I want to draw your attention to on this, this slide really is the reverse auctions for phosphorus. Now I've grayed that one out because this is actually one of our um, innovation trials. We, it's kind of a trial, we've been doing it for three years, it seems to be dragging on forever, but um, it is technically a trial. <laughs> um, and. Uh, it's, this is basically looking at how nature-based solutions can be implemented to reduce phosphorus, um, uh, but also looking at how reverse auctions themselves work for engaging our farming communities. And this is basically off the back of the success that Entrade has had, um, that, which was spun out of Wessex Water. Um, and I guess whilst this reverse auction scheme has had a water quality driver of phosphorus, um, and we've been running it in the Wye and the Dove Rivers in Derbyshire. Um, the measures themselves, which we're offering, um, have been chosen to help improve the biodiversity of the grasslands where they're being implemented, or the underlying soil health of where they're being implemented, um, but also helping to engage our communities in a different way to what they used to. Because reverse auctions is a very new thing. 
Um, and it's uh, quite a hard challenge to get your head around, even for somebody, um, you know, that's working on it day to day. Um, it's, it's not the most intuitive thing, I guess. Um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's looking at um, not just the environmental goods, but also the, the impact to our communities on how we can engage with them and build up their trust. Now this slide is really just highlighting what we've managed to achieve so far. So um, we've been running our program for the last, uh, where are we now, 2021? So the, the last six, seven years, I think. Um, and we've engaged with over 10,000 farmers in that time. We've removed over 20 tons of unwanted pesticides from our, using our pesticide amnesties. We've signed up over 46,000 hectares of applicable land to our farm to tap scheme every year. Um, we've awarded over 2,300 steps grants, signed up over 33,000 hectares of land to be sprayed with low drift nozzles. And over the last two years alone, we've created over 2,100 hectares of new habitat. Um, and the images here are just some of the things that we funded. So we've got everything from hard capital items like pesticide spray washdown areas um, through to low input grasslands. Um, we've put in quite a number of constructed wetlands for managing um, phosphorus issues mainly. We've got biofilters, which again is a, a capital item. Um, rainwater harvesting, that's mainly been in the Peak District to help um, farmers become more resilient to drought. We've got sediment retention ponds um, to help slow the flow of the water. And then we've even funded a, a boat for a farmer who wanted to go out and do some invasive species control with uh, signal crayfish trapping. And so you can see, whilst not all of these on the screen are nature-based solutions, they all have an environmental benefit. Um, and ultimately all of these help us as a water company to reduce our treatment costs. So I thought I'd take you through a, a quick case study just to highlight where we've utilized nature-based solutions really well for multiple benefits. Um, and this is our borehole at Rufford in Nottinghamshire. Um, we've had high and increasing nitrate concentrations linked to outdoor pig farming in the area. Um, and after quite a thorough investigation, we, we've worked with the farmer, build up um, trust with the farmer um, and managed to get them into a 10 year agreement with us to remove the pigs from the adjacent fields to our borehole. The farmers paid um, £10,000 over 10 years to put those fields into a mixture of buffer strips, uh, nectar, flower and wild bird mix, uh, field managing their field corners um, and arable reversion and in field grass. Um, to help prevent the runoff and these it, it, the, the pigs haven't gone they've been moved elsewhere into the, the area um, obviously we can't ask him to remove his pigs entirely but um, they, he's, they've been moved into a, a lower risk site basically and by putting the those fields that would have been outdoor pigs into the, the options that you see on the screen we've got multiple benefits here we've got the water quality benefits from the, the nitrate in the borehole that will be decreasing um, we've got flood flooding benefits um, because we've got cover on those fields we've got the biodiversity benefits particularly from the nectar flower and wild bird mix um, areas we've got benefits to carbon and then we've also got benefits to aesthetics. Now I've only ticked flower and bird mix there for aesthetics, but generally it's all of those are not exactly ugly, are they? <laughs> Marable reversion and grass fields aren't exactly ugly. And then also for our customers, um, we see a reduction in those nitrate peaks. And as a side note, cryptosporidium risks. And together they mean that we don't need to upgrade or install new treatment, which would have cost the company 2.4 million pound in capital costs plus a yearly operational cost of over a hundred thousand pound so ultimately that money doesn't get put onto customers bills and so it allows us to keep our, our customer community um well happy i guess so overall is is our approach working um well, we've got 44 catchments and I couldn't fit all of them on the screen. So I've only picked the pesticide ones. Um, 
which uh, total 10, I think. Um, and basically in, in AMP6, our targets were all around engaging with farmers, positive engagement with farmers, getting building up that trust with them. And that consequently by building up that trust, that allowed us to move into AMP7 um, to a, a move to a more outcomes-based approach. So based on actual load reduction targets. So water not water quality targets in terms of concentrations, but load reduction that's entering those water, water bodies. And uh, these targets were set up using um, the treatment capacity at the treatment works, um, as well as the in-river sampling data. And basically the, the difference between the peak um, sampling data and the treatment capacity, uh, treatment capability at the treatment works is our load reduction target as a percentage. And we, we use these tar we use the ADAS farm scoping model to uh, monitor the baseline, but also our progress towards these targets. And you can see the targets for pesticides on the, the left-hand side of the screen in the, the table. Um, and also our progress so far. Now I do stress that these are provisional results at the moment. We're only in year two of, of a five-year program. Um, but as you can see, it projected so far, we're even at the end of year two, we're still pro projecting to meet our five-year target in year two at four of our catchments. And so to be honest, we're, we're really pleased. Um, we've got another three years to go to get the rest of them on track. Um, but as you can see, our approach does seem to be working. But of course we have learned lots along the way. Um, and that's what I'm just going to quickly touch on now in this slide. Um, so the first one being how to manage the uncertainty and the risk. Um, what the, the approach we've taken with this is that you can, well, nature-based solutions, they, they have a higher, a higher risk of, higher risk of failing, but when they do fail, they fail slowly compared to traditional treatment, which when that fails, it will spectacularly fail. If you know what I mean. So it's a different risk profile for a company. We're not, we're not used to that risk profile. And so the way that we've been working in the drinking water side of, of the business is by simply getting more uptake of those nature-based solutions so that if one or a couple of them do fail, it's not going to impact on our targets overall. Um, and a good example of this is our farm tap work where the modelling showed that we needed 75% uptake of all applicable fields that had metaldehyde applied to them in order to be compliant to our water treatment works. But actually, once you put in cropping cycles and weather and you know various other factors, uh, that 75% is sort of variable in itself. And so to be safe, we aim for 90% or more. And that allowed us to be, we've actually been uh, compliant to our treatment works for the last few years now um, for metaldehyde. So if that approach does work. Um, another, another thing that we've learned is that spot samples, traditional water quality spot sampling um, alone is not sufficient in order to monitor compliance. And this is consistent with other monitoring studies like the dem demonstration test catchments. And this is particularly so for um, phosphorus and nitrate, um, the signal just gets lost, basically. Um, there's too much uncertainty, there's too many variables to discern between. Um, you can monitor field scale interventions, but only if they are taken at the, the outfall itself of that field. It can't really be used to effectively monitor progress in a, a catchment scale. And so we need to look for alternative solutions such as the farm scope model. Um, and then finally, building trust with our farmers can take anywhere from about 18 months to five years. Um, some catchments, it, it's a lot easier and others, it's, it's just really hard. And that ultimately impacts on what solutions you can actually get in, in the ground. Um, and as a water company for us, how quickly we can get to our targets. Um, we, you can really see this, uh, the discrepancy in catchments where we've worked for sort of five, six, seven, 10 years versus catchments that have only come online in the last year. Those catchments that have only come online recently, have, we're, we're, we're struggling a lot more to get to our targets. So that's um, the approach that we take at Seven Trent for drinking water. And like I said, it's been 
what we've been doing for, for years already. Um, the next section is nature-based solutions for the wastewater side of our business, which is something we've only started doing in the last year. So it's really not as developed as the, the drinking water side of the businesses and it's very early stages. Um, and the challenges are very different. We're, we're not aiming to meet a drinking water standard or a water quality uh, 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 environmental standard as such um, for water quality. We're, we're aiming to meet a discharge permit. So we're not looking at water treatment works here. We're looking at sewage treatment works. Um, and the reason this whole uh, sort of work stream of nature-based solutions in wastewater has come about for us is because we're getting um, discharge permits coming in at some of our sewage so treatment works um, over the next few years. Now these discharge permits are becoming increasingly more stringent and consequently they are getting harder and harder to meet because the technology just isn't there at the moment to allow us to to, to, to meet those um, permit uh, requirements. And so as a company, we need to start looking at alternative ways that we can still meet those, those targets. Um, and the way we've, well, we've got several, we've got several work streams are, um, going on at the moment in this space, um, but yeah, can we um, implement a nature-based solution that will allow us to meet that permit or or go above and beyond that permit so that we're not just meeting what we need to meet, but can we also meet, um, create new habitats, create recreational access, provide something more to the communities that, that they're going into rather than just a big concrete, um, big concrete treatment solution that you might not know it's there, but it doesn't, pro it doesn't provide anything other than treatment. There's nothing more, there's no more benefits to it other than that. And so we're currently just trialing this approach um, with an aim to embed it within the wastewater side of the business by 2025. Um, and so this slide really just goes through the, the projects that are being considered in this, this space. So we've got one called catchment nutrient balancing, which is the piece that um, my team are leading on. So this is looking at how um, nature-based solutions applied within the catchment upstream of the discharge point can be used to offset our phosphorus um, requirements. So rather than upgrading our treatment works, we'll be, we'll be uh, implementing solutions in the catchment, which will have a phosphorus reducing um, quality or benefit um, rather than upgrading our works. And um, we're also looking at wetlands. Um, so wetlands up the, the, the asset itself and how these can um, meet our discharge permits. And we're also looking at reactive media. Um, and all of these uh, have multiple benefits. We've not, you're not just working with nature, you're, you're capturing carbon, you're um, benefiting designated sites like triple SIs. Um, biodiversity creation and climate resilience. You get engagement, not just with the farmers, but with the local communities that these are going into. Um, it allows us as a company to look at flexible permitting and also looking at combined solutions, which is not something we've been able to do before as a company. We can't, it, a single solution is treatment that goes in that does what we need to do. Combined solution means, well, maybe we can do a little bit of treatment, maybe a treatment wetland, and then we do something in the catchment as well so that we get more benefit um, and we still manage to meet what we need to meet as a company. But there are, as you can see on the right hand side of the screen, there are concerns as well. Uh, this approach in wastewater side of the business hasn't been done before. And there's only three companies in the UK that are being allowed to trial this out. And we're one of them. So it's very, very new. Um, I've mentioned previously the risk of nature-based solutions versus traditional treatments, a very different risk profile. And it's not something that um, is, I guess we're particularly comfortable with, and that's just because we're not used to it. So managing that risk um, is uh, something that we need to understand going forward. Um, nature-based solutions for this, this requirement on the wastewater side require so much monitoring, way more than they do on the drinking water side of the business. Um, and also we need uh, long-term agreements with third parties. We're reliant on 
land being available in the catchment by working with a farmer or a charity or a, another large landowner. Um, and if that if they don't want to engage with us, then we're stuffed, really. Um, and then finally, all of this needs to fit in with the water industry inv investment cycles. I don't know if you know, but we, we work in five year cycles, investment cycles called AMPs. We're currently in AMP 7 um, and you get a, a budget within each AMP to do specific things. Um, and this, yeah, so we can't just, if we need to meet a discharge permit at a wastewater site, this AMP, then we've got budget to do that. We have to do it that AMP. We can't just delay it so that we can have a bit more sort of time to, to build up a nature-based solution. So how do we go about doing this in the wastewater side of the business? Um, well, we've considered 61 rural sewage treatment works initially. They all have P permits coming into place over the next few years. They're all very small. They serve 2000 people or less. And we did an initial screening of all of these sites, which um, sort of removed over half of them. And this, this is just because there's either technical issues on the site, it looks like there's insufficient cost, save, cost savings. Um, and yeah, that only took us to, to 30 sites take, being taken to, to full evaluation. And they could be, um, they could, they could be uh, evaluated for catch for neutral balancing, wetlands, reactive media, or one or all of them. Um, so of these, 17 are being considered for catchment nutrient balancing, six for wetlands, seven for reactive media. Um, and all of these options are being worked up alongside each other um, because of the overlaps between them, between the sites and the options being considered. And so once all of those options have been worked up, um, we all of the workstream owners then come together and we figure out the best solution for the site itself. Now I can talk all day about catchment nutrient balancing because it's my bit of work, the rest of them I can't, so I'll go into more detail on this, but this is effectively just takes you through our catchment nutrient balancing approach. So we're looking at, um, we start with the catchment characterization, so looking at um, the size of the catchment, the types of farms, the, the farm size, um, we do a lot of ground truthing at this stage to understand um, crop types and land use patterns then move to a phosphorus contextualization so looking at the inputs of phosphorus the transformations between different um, types of phosphorus looking at the trends in the rivers and um, the water quality there we then relate that to what we're seeing in the catchment characterization stage and uh, look at source apportionment between the different sectors because it's obviously not just farming and ourselves that input phosphorus into the system we then look at feasibility and how can catchment nutrient balancing work so nature-based solutions in the catchment can they actually deliver the phosphorus required required to meet our discharge permit and at this stage we also do a high level cost benefit analysis and that's because we are a, a company at the end of the day all of this work that we do all of the the the, the investment that we do has it, it gets put back to customers bills so we have to make sure that we are doing the best for our customers um, and then if it passes that stage, it will move to detailed scheme design. So we're looking at detailed cost benefit analysis, the wider environmental benefits from implementing different solutions. We look at risk of failure, the risk of success, sensitivity, sensitivity analysis, and the output from that stage is a detailed plan. So we know exactly how much of the different nature-based solutions we need in the catchment in order to meet our permit requirement. Now we're looking at a suite of monitoring techniques for this project, um, and this is to help us quantify progress, but also compliance, um, because it is a discharge permit, so we have to be compliant with it. Um, and we're looking at uh, the traditional things like water sampling, but as I previously mentioned, it doesn't actually show you that much. Um, so we're looking at alternative things that we can do as well. So one of which is using biological monitoring in the rivers by using the 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 fairly new um, total reactive phosphorus index, which uh, looks at the, the, it's not my area of work to be honest, but looks at the sensitivity of biological organisms to phosphorus and how we can use that to monitor the effectiveness of our, our schemes at, at the catchment scale. 
um, where maybe the water, traditional water quality sampling may not show progress. We're also looking at other monitoring techniques like soil monitoring, and that can be done at the field scale. Um, we're looking at farm gate nutrient budgets, again, at the farm scale. And then, as I've said previously, we're looking at farm scope and modeling. And that's really just as a check that what we're doing at the catchment scale is going toward, is, it is progressing in the right direction. Now, on the catchment nutrient balancing work, we've actually got to the end of the feasibility work. Um, and of those 17 that went through, um, only 11 are actually in contention. We can only take 11 through. Um, and that's basically because catchment, there isn't enough phosphorus in the catchment for us to go at. So whilst we could implement nature-based solution, it wouldn't be cost effective um, into, it wouldn't be cost effective, effective for us to do that in that uh, situation. Moving on to wetlands, we're also looking, so this is our free surface water treatment wetlands um, to treat the effluent before um, it, it's discharged out into the river. Now we don't have capability in house to do this. So we've been working with a whole host of rivers trusts, which you can see on the screen um, to help us do this. Um, so these wetlands, they don't just treat the water, obviously if they're, this is assuming they're designed correctly, but they, they help provide habitat within the area. Um, and they also provide recreational benefits to the communities that they serve within, assuming that access is given. Um, and so we had uh, six in contention that were taken through to full feasibility and of them only two are likely to be uh, suitable for wetlands um, to, uh, for dish to meet the discharge permits. And that's usually, I, uh, those that aren't suitable is usually because there's either too much land take required. I think most people think that water companies have an awful lot of land, um, but really we don't. We have, it's, most of our land is, is operational land not and obviously for a wetland you need quite a lot of uh, land which often will be outside of our patch so there's often just not enough land available um, sometimes you can't just do a wetland there's still requirement for other treatment capability in order to meet the discharge permit and obviously if that's the case then the cost implications are obviously are often too high and so of those six we've only taken two through to to Full delivery. And then the final one is reactive media. And these are effectively reed beds, which are supplemented with bed media, which can provide some form of phosphorus removal capability. Now, it's our innovation team that are leading on this, but they've been trialing a, a number of media um, within this project. And they've got three which are looking particularly good. Um, however, of the seven sites that were initially being considered only three are likely to be able to utilize the reactive media for this sort of capability um, and so collectively from catchment nutrient balancing to wetlands to reactive media you probably tell that there's quite a lot of challenges um, to work through with nature-based solutions it doesn't always make them feasible however much we want them to go in place um, it doesn't always make them cost effective um, and so that's really what I'm going to touch on now in my final section, which is uh, all of these different challenges. Um, the first one being regulations. Um, we're as a, as a water company, we're increasingly coming up against new regulations, which are impacting our ability to, to deliver this catchment work. Most recently, this has been the recent Environment Agency polluter pays uh, principle for agricultural measures. And this effectively states what elements of catchment nature-based solutions we are allowed to fund as a water company and what we can't fund um, with regards to, yeah, with regards to that with, with our farmers. Um, so the key message here is that we can't, we can't fund anything regulatory. And to be honest, that's what we've, we agree with. That's what we've been living by um, in the drinking water side of the business as well. Um, but there is a movement in the sort of the, the interpretation of what is considered regulatory, um, particularly with farming rules for water. So what is deemed reasonable precautions to surface runoff, for instance, um, and that consequently can rule out some uh, nature based solutions, which we and other water companies currently offer, such as cover crops. Um, 
Additionally, the, the guidance is only applicable to those catchments where we're undertaking catchment nutrient balancing. So it doesn't actually cover the nature-based solutions being offered on the drinking water side of our business. Um, so there are inconsistencies to the approach. Um, and uh, yeah, so for example, we, we could fund a farmer um, to put in fencing if their land fell within a drinking water catchment but not if their land fell within a wastewater catchment, even though the delivery and the benefits would be the same. And so it's working through these new regulations. Um, the second thing is risk and uncertainty. I've already touched on this, but nature-based solutions have a uh, naturally higher risk of failure than the traditional solutions. And so organizations can be reluctant to, to implementing them. Um, however, when traditional solutions fail, they tend to fail spectacularly. Um, but whereas nature-based solutions will fail gradually over time. And so there needs to be some work undertaken on how to manage this, this sort of changing risk profile. Um, and linked to this, nature-based solutions for wastewater actually need to deliver 50% more than what is required that, of a traditional solution. Um, so, and this is to kind of help manage this risk aspect. So it helps us if there's an extreme event that takes place, obviously a nature-based solution is quite likely to fail. And by, um, by implementing a solution that is 50% more than what you need, um, it allows you to sort of a larger opportunity to remain compliant um, with your target. Um, so touching on compliance, um, we are a water company that needs to meet water quality targets, but Nature-based solutions can't often be monitored at the catchment scale using water quality data alone. And so really our regulators need to uh, get on board and understand um, the more flexible and innovative monitoring techniques, such as the biological and soil monitoring that I mentioned earlier. Um, I touched on the investment cycles. So um, we're currently in AMP 7, um, our seventh investment cycle. Um, and at the moment, our budgets are for spending on the priority water quality issues of the catchment. And this is to help keep customers bills low so that we don't have to treat that water or we'll treat it as much anyway. Um, but obviously uh, this makes it harder for more bespoke projects to get funded. So if we see uh, uh, an area in the catchment which could really benefit from one particular nature-based solution, doesn't necessarily mean that we can fund it um, just because of the nature of the, the water industry investment cycles. Um, upskilling our operational teams to help them understand the, the new methods for delivery. I know it sounds a bit sort of odd, but um, the water industry is quite an old industry um, and our habits are fairly ingrained within the industry. Um, and consequently delivery of targets and, and standards, I guess, via nature-based solutions. It does scare quite a lot of people within our business. And so there needs to be a bit of work to, to help them understand the methods for delivery and the, and the benefits to working in this way, not just for, for them, but the, the communities that they're working within as well. Um, I'd like to touch on blended finance. So this is often, uh, often the biggest benefits from nature-based solutions can come when you work in partnership with other stakeholders, with other, with other people on the ground. Um, however, from a, a delivery point of view, this is a lot harder. Um, and we found it especially so for farmers. Um, really, there needs to be a, a mechanism, better mechanism anyway, um, in place to help blended finance, blended funding um, to, to sort of come online seamlessly so that the biggest benefits can be realized because the, the, the biggest challenge, the biggest, we, we don't want to lose our engagement with our farmers just because the finance is there, but it doesn't happen seamlessly. Um, linked to that sort of engagement and trust. We, we can't go in gung-ho into an area. Um, we've learned from our nature-based solutions for drinking water treatment that you, you need a bit of a lead in time and to build up the engagement and the trust before most farmers will do anything with you. Um, and like I said, in some, some areas, this, this has taken a full five years before they felt, yes, I can trust that person. I want to work with them. Um, and so it means that some targets and some 
nature-based solutions don't always naturally align with um, the engagement or the investment cycles. If you if you start working in a catchment five years uh, five years ago, but actually you can't get a farmer to 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 work with you till five years later, then you're automatically in the next investment cycle. And your targets may have changed by that point. Um, so it's it's. Uh, yeah, that, that is a challenge really, I guess, um, matching those up. Um, and then I touched on this as well, um, available land or lack of. <laughs> um, there's a bit of an assumption that water companies own a lot of land. We don't, it tends to be operational. Um, and so really we're reliant on being able to engage with third parties to access their land um, and help us deliver many of these nature-based solutions in partnership with them. And it's obviously not always, uh, uh, we're not always able to do that. Now, I don't like to end anything on a negative, um, because they, and especially this, because nature-based solutions are really, really good. They're amazing and they really should be, they, they are and should be the way forward. Um, they provide so many multiple benefits and goods, um, especially when compared to traditional solutions. You just don't get these kind of um, benefits with traditional solutions. Um, so I'd like to end on this beautiful picture on the screen here. This is from our Hope Valley Farmers Project um, up in the Peak District. This is where we're helping them to create new species rich grassland. I mean, you, you look at that, that's beautiful. All those lovely flowers, all those orchids. Um, you can't say that nature-based solutions aren't worthwhile. So in this case, we're, we're helping them to create species rich grassland, which obviously you get the pollinator benefits, you get um, the bird benefits, they get the benefit from um, their hay creation, we get the water quality benefits coming from it. No, nobody can say that that's a bad thing. Look how beautiful it looks if you happen to be walking by. Um, and yeah, on the right hand side of the screen here, I've just touched on some of those, those benefits to society that nature-based solutions provide. Um, everything from climate change to food security and human health. Um, and I guess, yeah, I just want to hammer home that at Seven Trent, we really do realise the benefit of these na of nature-based solutions in order to, to provide a, a better world. <laughs> I know it sounds cheesy. Um, and we're really doing all that we can to make sure that they form parts of our business as usual activities for the future um, over the short term and uh, longer term as well. Um, and I think that is it. Does anybody have any questions? Absolutely perfect timing. Yeah. <laughs> Just a few questions. So <laughs> there was a chap called Athanasios, but he seems to have disappeared. So I think if we want to go to, to Claire, first question. Well, mine was a very simple one, um, which was, I don't know what a reverse auction is. Oh, no, well, you're not the only one, Claire. Uh, it took me, <laughs> took me so long to get my head around them. Um, it is effectively, instead of um, an organisation uh, dictating the price, you are asking the person what price they would like to receive for delivering a good, an environmental good. So, it's, so who, who, was, who were you asking? I can't remember, this is this the farmers or is this We were asking farmers in that, in that project, yeah. So instead of, with steps for instance, we will say, right, for a bit of fencing we'll pay I don't know, five pound a metre. But in a reverse auction, you'd say, I'd like to put some fencing here to reduce our crypto bridging risk. How much will you accept? And then do you go with the cheapest bids? Is that how it works? Yeah, so obviously we have a budget and yeah. we'll have to work out um, per kilogram of phosphorus or whatever the, the pollutant is, the cost effectiveness and rank them until we, we use up all our budget, basically. Okay, lovely, thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, Diogenes, do you want to unmute? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for that. I, I was just interested in the soil health indicators. Um, what you have considered and what are the targets and how you measure them. Sorry, say that again. I was interested in the soil health indicators that you mentioned. Yeah. And yep. I was interested in what, what actually are the indicators and what are the targets and how do you measure them? Yes, yes. So uh, that's not actually my project, but I think there's going to be a lunchtime lecture on that in a few months' time. So I won't give too many games away. Um, but um, 
for the for the soil health project you're looking at things like um the so the the biological activity of the soil looking at carbon organic carbon organic matter um we're actually we're looking at the pesticides in the soil and the re actual reduction of them as well um and there are there are another things sorry it's not my project but i know there's a lunchtime lecture coming up on it so <laughs> I'll, um, I, no, I that's okay thank you wrong. <laughs> thank you very much thank you uh, okay uh, the next question was from me really i think you kind of answered it so i was just really saying asking if if some of the work you do can link in with elm payments that farmers are receiving for things like nature and landscape recovery yes yeah so it's our it's our biggest sort of excitement and worry at the same time really um not really knowing obviously we know we know the broad idea of what elm is going to look like but um up to now with countrywide stewardship our scheme has sort of slotted in quite nicely really yeah. Um, what what countrywide stewardship, the failings of countrywide stewardship were the benefits of ours, if you like. So it slotted in quite nicely with elms. I think farmers are uh, we we need to work out how to blend them together, mm -hmm. but farmers are reluctant at the moment. We're we're seeing a bit of a drop off in uptake of our schemes because farmers just don't know what it's going to look like. Oh, um, okay. And yeah, it's 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 all because of this. The blended finance situation what what can we and can't we fund yeah i was thinking he, he, he's going to get paid basically twice for the same thing if there's something that links him right yeah so i mean with that, yeah we we can't we can't do double funding and we yeah. Yeah, we yeah. have we have a lot of um yeah even with country stewardship we've never been able to double fund anything we've had to do a lot of checks and balances but okay uh, i see a Thanasios is, is back. So I think you lost connection. Do you want to ask your questions? Yeah, yeah. Hi, thank you, Charlie. Uh, thanks, Alex, for your presentation. Yeah, yeah it was just, um, obviously, you've got some data there. I was just wondering how you go about um, converting sort of schemes on a farm level into a catchment area level. Like, you know, what are the challenges around getting meaningful data that allows you to know certain schemes are um, effective in, in your objectives. Yeah, yeah, so it is a challenge. Um, we actually start, we actually start at the other end, we start at the catchment level and then work back to the to the farm level for delivery. And then obviously go back up to the catchment level again to work out progress and compliance. Um, so yeah, we kind of start with a catchment investigation looking at all the different characteristics and then work work out what needs to be done broadly. And then we can start going down into the detail at the farm level to, to go, we go onto a farm, we'll look at the, the opportunities there. Um, obviously we know roughly what needs to be going in at the catchment level in order to meet our targets, um, but it's at the farm level that we'll, we'll do the detail. And then um, once that's been designed and implemented, We'll have, um, we have various monitoring. So we've got monthly catchment sampling dotted throughout all of throughout the region. Um, we've got uh, soil monitoring, as I've said before. Um, we've got biodiversity monitoring through the ecology team, the in-house ecology team. And so combined together overall, we can then work out what progress is at the catchment level really. And that is ultimately shown in the water quality uh, data going into our water treatment works. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and my second question was how um, nature-based solutions can be used as proxies for uh, biodiversity, carbon reduction standards, uh, given that there isn't a, let's say, biodiversity standard um, and we need to rely on proxies. How, how can the work you're doing be considered um, as proxies for biodiversity standards? And, certification schemes so when you say standards do you mean like um yeah it could be the red tractor leaf um okay. rainforest alliance how, how do we convert these nature-based solutions into a recognized solution for some of the challenges we face on biodiversity water quality um, carbon reduction that's a massive question <laughs> 
So um, I think for some some of the nature based solutions, we definitely do have that that knowledge and that data. It's not a, it's not as a, a proxy. We know that you implement that there, you're going to get at least this. Um, and there's quite a lot of data in the literature that says this kind of solution will benefit phosphorus by this amount um, on a typical land uh, ag piece of agricultural land. Um, the challenge, I think, is if you want accurate, really accurate data is uh, you obviously it's not just about um, having the, the monitoring afterwards. It's about knowing the, the site that it's going into to begin with to, in order to build up that data uh, to, uh, to know the result, the proper results, the detailed results of what's happening. Um, so I think there's quite a lot where we're not actually using them as proxies. We are we are using them. Um, we know that the benefits of them. Um, yeah, I'm not sure with regards to like red tractor and the other assurance schemes. I know that there's a lot of requirements for farmers these days to, to put in like woodland creation, do a lot of um, tree planting and stuff. Um, and I'm not sure, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not really sure how, without, without the, the certification schemes for like carbon and whatnot, yeah, they, they do, to be honest, farmers, it's going to have to be easy for the farmers, they're never going to be able to, to, to work, the, the average farmer can't work it out themselves, it needs to be easy, it's struggle, we struggle, and it's, we, we don't know the answers yet we're only starting to look into the carbon aspects of, of what we're doing and um yeah i'm sorry i'm not it's not a very <laughs> full answer i guess it's it's too up in the air i don't think i can give you a full answer to this question but i do think there are a lot of what we're doing where we do know the benefits but it is it is uh, dependent on having the accurate monitoring data i think that helps thank you alex <laughs> Okay, we can probably squeeze one more quick question in from, from Martin. Thank you, Charlie. Um, no, I just wanted to ask how long these schemes have been running in terms of years totally, and what year did you begin? Um, I live in the countryside in a village, and the local authority, I think it was with the council and the water board here, um, NI Water, and they put in recently, within the last, what, 15 years, they put in like a a six bed uh, filter um, uh, system, which was really good to see and be installed. And um, you can actually go for a walk around it. They've, they've made paths around it, which is really good. Um, sort of linking similarities to your presentation. Mm. So thank you for your presentation. And it's great to see this sort of work being done. Um, so it, it was great to see the local authority doing this. And it, it's yeah. actually each bed has a little pen stock which controls the water level and then it flows on to the next bed and then eventually it goes out into the closest river. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's really great to see this. Um, oh, yeah. just, just two simple questions, I suppose. Yeah, no, that's, that's really good. Um, yeah, I think it, it, well, in answer to your first question, so our catchments, our work and our catchment schemes have been running for, the schemes themselves have been running for a, where are we now? 2021. So I think we started in 2015 in earnest, and but we had started doing trials in sort of 2010. But we we were one of the the sort of pioneers, I guess. Not every water company tackles these these issues in the way that we do. We're one of the ones that have got. Uh, a, a, one of the biggest catchment teams basically and what we're, we're one of the ones we've got ODIs and, and things that allow us to be a bit more um, flexible and innovative in getting nature-based solutions out and trialing this stuff not every water company is in our same is in the same position as us but it's really good to hear that NI Water are doing that and I know that they are starting their own catchment scheme similar to ours um, because I've been involved in conversations with it so yeah, we'll probably hear more from them on this topic. <laughs> okay, thank you. I think just another comment is recently, I think a lot of farmers have ripped a lot of hedgerows down to minimum, but I think there could be possibilities for a lot of trees to be planted in good hedgerows, you know, where you've got good center distance between each tree. Yeah. And that way, like from experiencing winters where I live, you were driving up a road and it had, because we had the blizzards of, 
of maybe snow and winter, there was like part of the road was clear because the hedge was there. But when there was no hedge, like the, the rest of the snow was on the road, for example, you know, so things like that would be really uh, another addition to what you're doing, I think, as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And the tree planting is getting more and more popular now, isn't it? Because of the yeah. carbon aspect. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, I better draw it to a close because we're just slightly over. So thank you, Alex, for putting together that excellent presentation and for taking <laughs> some time out to present to us today. It's very much appreciated. No I'm problem. sure everybody found it really interesting. It's such a, a far reaching subject. Yeah. So just before we close, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and hope you will join us for our next lecture on the 13th of July, where we'll be joined by Tom Beach and Jack Wyatt from Autonomous Agri Solutions. Who are going to talk about their experiences with autonomous vehicles in agriculture. So all that's left to say is thanks again to everybody for joining and see you again next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.